Ypres is uh, one of the most beautiful cities of Europe. And in fact, in the Middle Ages, it was the most populous city in Europe. And it has a very deep resonance and meaning to us and generations of Australians because of the service, the suffering, the sacrifice of Australians in the Battle of Passchendaele in 1917. The last reminder of civilised existence that they had in this moonscape and mayhem of Passchendaele were those two lines. Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda, you come a waltzing Matilda with me. And his ghost may be heard as you pass by that villa bone. You come a waltzing Matilda with me. It's been 100 years since our greatest loss. Standing here, it is hard to believe that some 38,000 Australians were either injured or killed uh, in this vicinity. It's some of them are 15, 16 year old boys essentially, and they've come across to fight a war. To mark the centenary of those losses, a very special ceremony for the return of the Menengate Lions, on loan from Australia to their original home. I remember when the poppies started to come through the um, central vent in the middle of the arch, and they started to drift um, towards us, I just thought it was one of the most incredibly beautiful things I'd ever been a part of. Watching the lions returning and seeing them pictured side by side, looking so perfect with the other lion above the arch and realising that the sacrifice, that not just our men made, the women, the whole country, the young country coming to fight overseas and to join with other people from around the world. And it was a beautiful unifying moment for our world in troubled times that we exist in now. And I hope that our young men of our nation never have to pay a sacrifice like this again. They are truly national treasures of two countries. The lines are the witnesses of the bond between Belgium and, and Australia, and especially about Ypres and Australia. Yeah, it really hits home exactly what we, we did here and we're a part of and why we're here. And now, the lions are silent sentinels once again. The Menengate Lions are a thread which connects us, our inconsolable grief and mourning about the loss of Australians that had marched between the Menengate Lions down the Menin Road to the Battles of Passchendaele. That says so much about us as we were then and who we are now. Sculpted in 1822, the lion's great paws hold the coat of arms of Ypres. Originally at the entrance to the cloth hall, they were moved in 1862 to sit astride what's known as the Menin Gate, a gap in Ypres' ancient ramparts on a bridge over the city's moat. From 1914, it was the route taken firstly by Belgian troops, then all Allied armies on the way to fight the Germans in the infamous Ypres salient. Ypres itself was a daily target, laid waste by thousands of shells. 
When the diggers marched past Cloth Hall in 1917, down the Menin Road to the Menin Gate, the city was a shocking shell of itself. Winston Churchill wanted to keep Ypres as a museum of the destruction of the First World War. The Belgian people were determined that it would not be, that it would not be a symbol of defeat, that it would be a symbol of victory, and they rebuilt it. And I'm so glad that they did, to see the cloth hall standing there now in all of its magnificence, in such a short period of time, to have it rebuilt so well, I think is part of the triumph of the human spirit. It is very special for me to come here still. As you're walking down the road itself, you see the monument, and I see the names, and they start at the bottom and they go all the way to the top. The amount of names uh, on the walls there, were some 50,000 soldiers that have, have never been found and discovered somewhere buried around here. So it is a, an extremely sort of powerful image, um, and I feel, feel quite sad, really, when I, when I see it. The last post has sounded here every single night since 1928, a year after this memorial was built. The only exception, the World War II years. The names of Allied soldiers with no known graves are engraved on the walls. 6,000 are Australians, most of them lost in the Battle of Passchendaele. This was the most tragic and most significant of the battles that we fought in terms of loss through the Western Front. This was the wettest summer in the century. It was nothing but a moonscape, blood, mud and slime. The water was so deep, wounded men drowned in it. In eight weeks, Australia sustained 38,000 casualties. In the month of October alone, we had 6,000 dead and missing. The Australian official war photographer was Frank Hurley. He was 31 years old. He was the one who captured the most powerful and iconic images of the Battle of Passchendaele and he said every 20 paces was a dead body, most severely mutilated, many without heads and limbs, all half covered or almost submerged in slime and mud. There's something incredibly sad about the Belgian landscape in that area, probably because we know from the photographs of the incredible destruction and the deaths that were happening there and the scale of death, even though a lot of it has, has now recovered in this beautiful green farmlands. You're never too far away from a cemetery. And a place like Tyne Cot, 
um, which is the largest of the Commonwealth War Grave Cemeteries anywhere in the world, tell such a story of the scale of the sacrifice that happened in Belgium in 1917 particularly. It's a powerful place to walk. It's a quiet place. It's a solemn place. It's a reverential place. I think the scale of Tyne Cot doesn't hit you until you fully get into the actual graves itself and you start walking around the graves. And one of the things I always do notice is the age on those gravestones. It's truly remarkable some of the ages that these young men lost their lives at. So when you stand there and look at the scale of it, it just, it really, it completely blew me away how, how big that area is and how many gravestones are there. Whilst these men and gate lines are very emotional uh, objects for us, they are also for the Flemish people in Belgium. Brendan Nelson was the man who came up with the idea of loaning the lions back to Belgium for the Passchendaele centenary. That was back in 2011 when Dr. Nelson was Australia's ambassador to Belgium. The lions were gifted to Australia by Ypres in 1936. Damaged by shell fire, they had lain in the rubble of Ypres after the war. Australia's then High Commissioner suggested the city donate them to Australia's new war memorial. The Burgermeister of Ypres agreed. They were packed in wooden crates for the trip to their new home in 1936. The missing parts of the lions were reconstructed and added back to the statues. The lions weigh nearly two tons each. Removing them from the memorial is a precise and skilled exercise. Precious statues need to be trussed and balanced perfectly for the 10,000 nautical mile flight to Belgium. gives you an immense sense of pride to see one of our C-17s with the emblem of our, our Royal Australian Air Force having those lines go into its belly. He 
here we are, a hundred years later. We didn't have a Royal Australian Air Force in 1917. We had the Australian Flying Corps. But a hundred years after these events, the Chief of Air Force, Air Marshal Leo Davies, did not hesitate when I asked him if our Air Force would take our lines back to Belgium for the centenary. It's a four-day hop to Belgium via Darwin, Diego Garcia, and Dubai. Finally, after eight decades, the lions are back on Belgian soil. And then in Brussels, to have them come out of the aircraft and be welcomed with such dignity and pride by the Belgian Defence Force, and of course supported by us as well, that makes it all worthwhile. was the last person to see the lions in Ypres. Guy Gruitz is the living link. Guy is the link between the lions, uh, what happened in 1936 uh, with the High Commissioner's suggestion to the Burgomaster of Ypres, the packing, crating and loading of the lions onto the train in Ypres to go to Antwerp and then subsequently to Australia. Guise had a lifelong association with the men in Gate. For 40 years, he was chairman of the Last Post Association. To think that he's able to get up in the morning and open his window there in that apartment next to the cloth hall and look down the Menin Road toward the Menin Gate, to think that he has spent all of his life in that community, not only living in that community, but being the living link between the horrendous cataclysm that occurred there in the 1914, the families and those who survived, and then the world into which he was then born. I always remember Guy telling me at the age of eight, standing there holding his grandfather's hand, looking at the crates, AWM Canberra stamped onto the side of them, that I was at the hand of my grandfather. They were putting the, the lions on the wagon, and I, as a young boy, I, I was witnessing that, very interested. And now, of course, 70 years later, um, more, 80 years later, 82 years later, I will be absolutely uh, thrilled and happy to see them back for a while, of course. Eight decades after seeing them leave, Guy is the first to welcome them back. Here they're back. Fantastic. Are oh, you happy to, to be back? Perhaps, yes. Let's ask him. He seems a little surprised. Never, never thought it would be given to see them again. Thanks to Brendan Nelson. Fantastic. Fantastic idea for a fantastic man. And now to the gate.
The lions are moved to the Menin Gate, but remain covered until the dedication day. Where is the link to me? Yeah, that is the link to me. The left one is there. And where has the left to me? That. Oh, look at that. An emotional moment. In 15, Ypres was already in badly shape. A lot of bombardments had destroyed a big part of the city. And the troops were the unresting. They were resting on the other side of Ypres, between Ypres and Popperingen. And when the troops were ordered to go to the battlefield, they passed through the ruins of Ypres. They passed here on this bridge, and they went to the battlefield. So therefore, is this place very symbolic. It was, the, in fact, uh, the entrance to the battlefield. Among the diggers who crossed the bridge were three brothers, the Seabrook brothers. To reflect on that, the Seabrook brothers march past those lines, and, and that sort of means a lot to, to us. Um, they would have touched them, they would have seen them, and we're going to do likewise to them. I'm Wayne Sheen. I'm the great nephew of uh, the Seabrook brothers that passed away in battle. Um, 100 years ago, three years ago, I came here and experienced the, uh, the, the loss and the toll uh, for the first time. And I'm proud to come back here again now to represent the, uh, the, the siblings and the families of the siblings of the, the three Seabrook brothers. Three brothers all killed on the first day of their first battle. William, also known as Keith, was the youngest. In his tunic pocket, over his heart, his mates found a photo of the boy's mum, Fanny Seabrook. This is the original photo that was found in, in William's, in Keith's um, breast pocket. And uh, he, um, when, when he was mortally wounded, and as you can see, there is still the shrapnel hole through the, through the actual photograph. And um, you know this photo is over 100 years old and, and, and probably has pride of place in, in the Seabrook history. The bodies of the other brothers were never found, so Wayne is bringing his sister and brother to the Menon Gate to see the names of George and Theo Seabrook engraved on the wall. To see that tonight with, with Grant and with Julie is, is going to be a special occasion. And for them, it's going to be their first time. So they will feel the emotion that I felt three years ago. And it's going to be a significant time for me as well. Here's the names on the wall. Mm. It's amazing. Amazing. To think, that, to think that their bodies are out in the, in the countryside somewhere yeah. and, and here their names are on the wall, uh, along with 55,000 other names. Mm. It's um, very... Significant. Mm. 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 And tonight we'll lay a wreath in their memory. Yep. Firstly, though, a pilgrimage for Wayne and Julie to their great uncle's grave. Twenty-three B. Oh. Okay. Okay. Twenty-three B. Oh. We've all gone here. We should be able to see William. His headstone should appear. Mm. Oh, there it is. It's um quite emotional. It is. Would it be nice to have known him? Mm-hmm. Why don't we get the medals out okay. and put them there with the photo of Fanny? It's the original photo. Yeah. To lay a poppy that uh, has been personally made by one of the Seabrook descendants, Christy Seabrook, um, was great to lay that and then to put William Keith's medals on the top and 
then to reunite the photo um, that was in his breast pocket when he, when he was mortally wounded, uh, to have all that together in one place on the other side of the world for the first time in 100 years is a significant time. Finally, it's dedication day for the Lions, starting with a march down the exact same route taken by our diggers 100 years ago. There's a wonderful feeling that comes from being in, walking in the footsteps of people who've done great and mighty things. One of my favourite photographs uh, from the First World War is a photograph that Hurley took of a section of Australian troops marching past the ruins of the Cloth Hall, right in the heart of uh, Ypres. be able to be a part of the ceremony on that day, to retrace their steps, to see the Australian flag carried by the Fed Guard with the Belgian flag alongside, to see those two flags together on that night uh, was just wonderful. In some way, it was um, a commemoration, a remembrance in its own right of all of those people who'd done that previously. I was so incredibly proud of what the Australian Federation Guard did at the dedication of the Lions. To see the slouch hats, Australian Navy caps, the Air Force personnel, I felt like almost at home, certainly amongst friends. Yeah, I was just really proud to see what they had done. It was wonderful to see how many people had gathered at the arch that night. The ramparts were lined with people. All around the arch was packed. Everywhere you looked, there were people engaged and moved by what was happening there on that night. They heard from Australia's Minister for Veterans Affairs through conflict, ruin and sacrifice, these lions represent the strong and enduring friendship, a friendship that will never be forgotten between Belgium and Australia. The military, heritage and emotional significance of the men and gate lions to my nation, Australia, cannot be overstated. And Belgium's Vice Prime Minister, Today, these lions witness the last post once again. For the first time in over eight decades. This is a tribute to the 6,000 missing Australian soldiers whose names are engraved at the Men Gate. They will never be forgotten and our gratitude for their sacrifice will last forever.
They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. I remember when the poppies started to come through the um, central vent in the middle of the arch and they started to drift um, towards us. I just thought it was one of the most incredibly beautiful things I'd ever been a part of. The symbolism of the poppy, of course, is very well known. But to see everybody covered, made a part of the one event by the rain of these poppies was just extraordinary. And I think when those poppies fell from the arch that everyone could join and remember and have imprinted on their minds for eternity, really. The Lion's dedication was part of two days of ceremonies and songs for the Australian Defence Force singers. My name is Tracy Kennedy. I'm a leading seaman musician in the Royal Australian Navy Band in Sydney. And I've come over to Belgium to sing with the ADF singers as part of the Anzac Day services and commemorations for 2017. For the centenary events, Tracy learnt to sing the Belgian national anthem in Flemish. Singing it for the dawn service, it was just a really special feeling and quite eerie at the same time, I think, standing uh, on those fields and in the cemetery. And each time I've sung it, I feel certainly um, very proud to be able to learn it for the Belgian people and, and be a part of it. We ought to feel enormously proud of the Belgian people for what they have done and our relationship with them which is reinforced now, 100 years later, by the dedication of these lines. The return of the gift, the reciprocity of this gift back to Belgium, I think, is hugely important for Australia and Belgium. But I thought there was something much more important than that as well, and not just in dedicating those lines, but understand the significance of the place that we were in and what we were actually doing. Under that gate, with more than 6,000 Australian names um, inscribed on it, um, missing with no known grave. If ever there was a place to rededicate ourselves to understanding the meaning of sacrifice and the importance of rededicating ourselves, to finding a lasting and meaningful peace in the world. It was surely at that moment.
Victoria Cross recipient and War Memorial Council member Dan Kieran felt the impact of the lions on the locals. Sitting down with some of the locals last night, I was quite fortunate to, to do that after the service. It was an extremely successful service here at the Menangate. And some of these guys had, had done multiple services, uh, as a lot of the townsfolk have, but there was a real sense of pride that they are now back home and they're really looking forward to continuing the services as they did once before with the lion standing guard. For Tracy Kennedy, it was the experience of a lifetime. It made us, I think, the three singers and the Fed Guard really think about the special gift that was given to Australia at that time. And then to bring it back here has made it even more special for everybody. For Guy Gruetz, who'd waited 80 years for this moment, it was about eternal bonds. I think it underlines the participation of Australia in the remembrance, but it's also a token of friendship from Australia towards Belgium, and vice versa, because we, Belgium gave them in, in 1926. So I think it's a, it's a memorable uh, moment, and it's an emotional moment for both the nations. These lions are, in fact, treasures for two countries, and belonging as well to Australia as to Belgium, and to our town especially. Brendan Nelson sees the lions historically entwined with the diggers who fought and fell in battles of unimaginable horror. Just consider the fact that before they got there, they'd gone down the Menin Road, they'd gone between the Menin Gate lines, So when I see the lions, yes, I see the lions with the coat of arms of Ypres and know the history of the sculpting in 1822 and placing on the medieval wall in 1862. But what I see is what these men saw before they went into this, before they faced death, before they faced adversity and circumstances beyond our comprehension at all. That's what I see when I see the lines. As for Tim Sullivan, he was surprised by the range of emotions stirred by the event. The fact that we were there dedicating these lines in memory of all of those who'd given their lives for a better world, we could reflect on the fact that our allies from that time are still our close friends, that we are reconciled with our enemies from that time, it was incredibly poignant at the time that we were dedicating the lines. And then at the end of the day, to be able to look back on all that had been done across a very long day, in remembering the sacrifice of so many Australian lives, particularly in 1917. I felt that I had a better understanding of what the Australian War Memorial is about, why it does what it does, and why it has to continue to do what it does, and why remembering is so important. 